Again, here is the UFO. On the 3rd of May, 1975, the pilot, Carlos de los Santos, was flying in a Piper aeroplane. He called the control tower. Mayday, mayday. I no longer have control of the plane. I see three UFOs flying around me. One has touched the bottom of the plane. The plane is flying without my control. I can see the UFOs. One of them is opposite me. One is on the right wing, and one is apparently under the plane. Carlos was able to escape, but in other cases, in other countries, it doesn't always have a happy ending like this. Mexico City. The UFO sightings became very frequent after the total eclipse of the sun in 1991. After the eclipse, the Vigilantes organization was born. These are some of their photos. Here is a UFO, which seems to turn in the spiral on itself. Here is the same object, filmed from a different location. two of the many analyzed by the University of Mexico City. The first shows a UFO surrounded by an electromagnetic halo. The second, however, is that of a weather sounding balloon. Here we have a picture of a UFO taken by the police and other photos of UFOs taken in Mexico. of that on a computer. The researchers then went on to the place and interviewed the witnesses. They say there's no fraud, no hoax. Many sightings have happened in the area of Puebla, not very far from the capital and at the foot of the volcano. Is there a relationship between sightings and volcanic activity? Here we meet Soledad, a pediatrician with the vigilantes. Oh yes, it's a very simple relationship between the volcanic activity and the UFO sightings. And I can prove it. One week before the eruption, we saw a group of eight to ten UFOs which were moving about frantically, as if they wanted to warn someone. Exactly a week later, there was a volcanic eruption. This is one of the many photos taken at that time. This is a night sighting filmed by a Mexican cameraman. Hernandez. What they have seen are metallic objects, round, sometimes surrounded by a far like light or a halo. Certainly, they are rare pictures. They appear suddenly from nowhere and just as suddenly disappear into nowhere. So many people say they're ghosts 
magic, but is it an intelligence which has always existed, which has always been in our culture, even in our pre-Hispanic culture? Here we are at Tepozin, a couple of hours from the capital of Mexico City, a village in which pre-Hispanic culture is still present in daily life and in its traditions. We meet Carlos Diaz, who in the last 15 years has taken stunning photos and films of UFOs. He says he's in contact with their occupants and they are beings similar to us. Even these photos have been analyzed scientifically. They are enormous objects of light which can transform themselves into metallic disks. Estos objetos, Carlos eh, Diaz. These objects, so many times, have remained motionless, suspended in the air for up to two hours, hovering over the mountain, the peak of light, above the horizon for up to 20 minutes. Sometimes they move from one peak to another, very slowly, sometimes, however, incredibly quickly. Su movimiento es rápido. Carlos isn't the only one to have seen the UFOs. We've met so many people at Tepozion who speak about them as natural things. Mysterious, certainly, but seen by many. A cathedral has been built above the Aztec pyramid, using the material from it as a testimony to one culture superimposed upon another. Creo que Carlos. En, eh, en sí, I think that what we call the UFO phenomenon today is what our fathers have always observed, a phenomenon which belongs to reality, which they've always looked at in a natural way, as something normal, without feeling chosen or anything else. They've known these happenings for centuries. The original tradition, Mayan or Aztec, talks of beings coming from the sky, looking like humans, but with extraordinary abilities and knowledge. For this reason, they were seen as gods, coming from other worlds or from other dimensions of reality. This doesn't mean godlike beings, creators of everything, but beings more involved than us, our bigger brothers. The numerous sightings of UFOs in relation to the total eclipse of the sun in 1991 are contained in the old Aztec prophecies. The Mexican journalist, Jaime Marsman, one of the most thorough researchers of the phenomenon, talks about them. Here we see an Aztec pyramid which dominates the valley of Tepozion. Jaime Marsman. Mexico seems to be a very magical country with magical traditions, old legends, and there are many predictions, prophecies. There are prophecies from the ninth century. That's more than a thousand years ago. And this prophecy said that we should have big disasters, natural disasters, big confrontations, probably war. They said that the big lords would fall to, go, to give new space for the new lords, the new bosses, let's say. And they also said this was the time of the meeting with the masters of the stars. There is another prophecy. This is an Aztec prophecy connected to the eclipse. This eclipse is part of the legend of the eclipses, and this is the sixth zone. And they said that the, in the era of the sixth zone, everything that was hidden and buried would be discovered, that the truth would be the seed of life, and would be the sons of the sixth son, mm -hmm. or sons, those who would travel through the stars. And this prophecy is more than a 500 years old. It means that there is something magical connected to it. Probably it's from very old past. Mm -hmm. Probably all these prophecies were done by them to alert us of what was happening and coming. 
I am really convinced this is real. I am really convinced this is coming from out of space because the tape, the recording that was made in Metepec by Sara Cuevas proves that it, there is an extraterrestrial there connected to a, to a very important sighting. That means that these UFOs are maneuvered by these extraterrestrials. These are the pictures of the people from outer space, enhanced on the computer to make them more identifiable. And this is an old Aztec representation of a being coming down from the sky on a cloud which rules a whole palace, and of a being coming down symbolically on a winged dragon, perhaps their way of indicating a flying object. Are they visitors from space? Space relief, according to many experts, an astronaut is portrayed, sitting down in command of the spaceship. What can we say? In the old traditions, they talk about beings who came down from the sky to bring culture. Then they went away, saying that one day they would come down the old stairs again. The translation of the Mayan hieroglyphics says just this, one day, Kuku Khan will return. Is he about to? In ancient cultures, beings from the sky were seen as gods. Is it only a fantasy? It seems not. Only a few years ago, anthropologists discovered the same phenomenon, which they called the cargo cult. Whole populations in New Guinea remained in total isolation from our civilization until towards the end of the Second World War. Then they saw helicopters and military planes land on their islands, which were transformed into small bases. To get round the population, the pilots bought gifts. At the end of the conflict, the bases were abandoned. The anthropologists who consequently returned there discovered that a new cult had been born. The natives adored the planes and its occupants. They became gods from the sky. The USA. For generations, the Hopi Indians have handed down the memory of the visit by beings from space and they portray them like this. They are the Cassini, mysterious beings who brought great teachings. For generations, these masked men have been dancing so they will not be frightened of them when they return. The Cassina descended from flying objects that the Hopi portray in these pictures. They believe that one day the casino will return. Some tribes say that they've been visited in recent years by beings from space. The story of the Kajapo tribe in the Amazon hand down from father to son is the visit of a being from the sky completely open and friendly, who didn't drink or eat. In one night, he learnt their language and taught them farming and hunting skills. Before leaving, he promised to return. Africa, Mali country of the Dogon, 1946. 
The old priest, Ogo Tomeli, explained to the anthropologist, Marcel Griol, their vision of the world. The constellation of Sirius is visible to the naked eye, but Griol was surprised to find that the Dogon knew Sirius B in minute detail, including a very weak star, only visible with powerful telescopes. Sirius B is described as very small, made of very heavy metal, rotating around Sirius A with a cycle of 50 years. All of that is accurate, but that's only been known for a few years. This looks like much more than a mere coincidence. The Dogons say that all has been taught to them by the Neuromo, who came from the stars on an arc, red as far, but which became white when it landed. It had a pyramid shape. Surely this sounds like what we now call UFOs. The Dogon, in their feasts, remember the Neuromo as carriers of great wisdom. Even the Dogons say the Neuromo will return. But the UFO phenomenon seems to be present in, even in the distant past. These are some of the carvings discovered in the country's caves, almost living testimonies from thousands of years ago. Iraq. According to some experts, we can find very detailed information on UFOs and aliens in the old Sumerian culture, now considered to be the cradle of our civilization. The people then had extraordinary astronomical knowledge. Zachariah Sitchin. If somebody says, uh, uh, where did you get the idea? I say, I read the Sumerian tablets and that's what they say. They said uh, that our solar system is made up of 12 members. And this is stated in the Sumerian text over and over and over again, not one time. And they say there is the sun, which is in the center, not like the Greeks or others thought that the earth is in the center of the sun. Uh, there's the moon, which they gave reasons why they considered it a member by its own. And ten, not nine, but ten planets. Therefore, I'm very happy that when today astronomers look for this planet they call it planet x uh, they mean maybe the unknown planet but it's also the tenth planet they called it nibiru which means planet of the crossing and the ancient symbol was the cross not from christian times but from six thousand years ago uh, and they say that this planet the twelfth member of our solar system has a very large orbit of 3,600 years, and every 3,600 years it comes between Mars and Jupiter close to us. And it is then they said that people, uh, people that look like us, not uh, <laughs> with little horns or green, uh, people they look, that look like us started to come between their planet and Earth about 450,000 years ago. Why do they look like us? We look like them. Because if you know the Bible, which is based on the Sumerian tales, at some point they engaged in genetic engineering and mixed their genes with the genes of uh, Homo erectus. We can use uh, various uh, uh, scientific terms, but let's say with, with early hominids, to bring about Homo sapiens, us. The Sumerians call them Anunnaki, which means literally those who from heaven to earth came. It was not a one-time visit like they were traveling from here to there and crashed. They came and went, came and went every 3,600 years. And the original reason was to find gold, not uh, for jewelry, not for, uh, for coins, but to survive on their planet. 
because according to all these texts uh, that they dictated to the Sumerians about how it started and why they came and what they did before uh, we knew how to write, uh, that they were losing the atmosphere on their planet. And the atmosphere was the only thing, not only for breathing, etc., but that protected <coughs> the heat because the planet goes out very far, it's very cold, but has internal heat, which is protected only by the atmosphere, like a hothouse, like a greenhouse. If you lose the atmosphere, you lose life. So their scientists decided that the only way to protect it is to create a shield of gold particles. And Earth apparently is the only planet in our solar system that has gold. Uh, all the religions we know about, uh, even the esoteric ones like the Hindu and the Maya, etc., uh, not to speak about the Bible, which speaks about the return uh, of the kingdom of heaven to earth, the second coming, uh, all these expressions, uh, uh, the Jews uh, believe in uh, messianic times. Uh, also, it seems that the memory of mankind all over the world is that they will come back. All the indications, there's the, the Maya calendar, which comes to a culmination in 2012. Uh, or many, many signs that things are about to happen. Uh, I cannot tell you now exactly the date. Uh, the question, the interesting question is uh, what, what will happen when they come back? If you check the progress of our civilization, the Sumerians, before the Sumerians, you know, the Neolithic, the New Stone Age, the Mesolithic, etc. It was every 3,600 years. It is as if each time they come, they take a look at us and say, okay, let's give them more knowledge, more civilization. But one time they said, it's no good. So what will happen? I don't know. I'm not a prophet, but I can tell you what happened in the past. Of course, these are both amazing and frightening things. But couldn't this tablet be interpreted as showing the descent of a spaceship? Is it a question of God? Either you say each planet is a little world and has its own God. Or you say there is one God for the whole universe. And this is what the Anunnaki believed in. Their God was the God of the universe. And this also comes out in the Bible, especially in the prophets, uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, etc., of a universal God that encompasses the whole universe. Is this the link between the Sumerians and the ancient Egyptians? The gods were the same. They're called different names, but they were the same, the same, the same Anunnaki. Uh, according to the Egyptian religion, they believed that the Pharaoh, being a demigod, half a god, uh, was entitled, after his death, to go on a journey to the afterlife to join the gods on their planet. So the whole Egyptian religion, the whole Egyptian uh, royal life, all the monuments, all the temples were really geared to this one moment when the pharaoh dying was uh, mummified and through a door facing east joined the gods. In my book, I describe uh, the journey, not as a mythical journey, but as a real journey to the spaceport of the Anunnaki after the deluge, uh, with which the pyramids are connected as, as the landing corridor. And it was there that the Egyptian pharaohs wanted to join the gods to go to travel to the planet. 
uh, that no pharaoh, no pharaoh built the pyramid. The Anunnaki built it as part of a landing corridor to the spaceport in the Sinai. Even in the old Egyptian texts, the descent to earth of beings from the sky is talked about. This may be surprising, but it's what numerous experts maintain. Monsieur Bouval. The ancient Egyptians maintained that their ancestors had come from the stars and that they were the descendants of those ancestors and as part of their heritage would one day return to their native lands, the stars. They said that those stars were in the Orion constellation. From my studies, it seems that the disposition of the pyramids corresponds to the position of the Orion constellation as it would have been many years ago. I calculated that it goes back to 105,000 BC. Perhaps it was then that something extraordinary happened, which was necessary to record in such a majestic way. Reading the hieroglyphics, there's no doubt in my mind that the beings from the stars reached them at that time. The ancient Egyptians knew astronomy, geometry, construction, etc. It's probable that this knowledge was given to them by those visitors. You see, according to many Egyptologists, the pyramids of Giza marked the beginning of a civilization, but I don't agree. I think it was a question of a long-term plan, an apotheosis which expresses something which had been a long time in the making. Even in the Bible, there are episodes which would make you think of the descent of the spaceships, like that of the prophet Ezekiel and the square of Far. This was in 500 BC. Eric von Daniken. Ezekiel describes what he saw. It was a luminous square which got nearer to him. He describes the rotation of it its wings, the noise, which he compared to that of a military camp or to the roar of a great mass of water. In the whole account by Ezekiel, at least in the Hebrew original, the word God is never mentioned. Ezekiel worked in the fields with others. Then he saw the square of fire coming down. They all threw themselves onto the ground, frightened. He then heard a voice, which in its own language told him not to be afraid, calling him Son of Man. Ezekiel was no longer afraid, and he looked at the square and described it as splendid. On the top, he sees something similar to a sparkling precious stone, inside which he saw a throne on which a man was seated. On the basis of Ezekiel's descriptions, the NASA engineer Joseph Blumnich has constructed a series of model aircraft and the engineer Hans Beer has made a model of the airport where Ezekiel's spaceship would have landed. Now we're in India. In the ancient Vedic texts, you can find testimonies of astronauts who've come from other worlds and from other dimensions, who have met beings from different races exhibiting extraordinary powers. There are old texts which illustrate various types of spaceships and which explain their function. They are the Vinana, which reminds us of what we call UFOs today. They have extraordinary flying capabilities and could disappear and reappear at speed. In the ancient texts, they talked about objects as big as whole cities parked in space and from which smaller armed objects left to wage war with other flying objects. 
That's what's recounted in many of the old Vedic tales, but you have to read them in a positive, non-mythological way. This is Mr. Thompson. The UFO phenomenon and the descriptions in the ancient Sanskrit texts are referring to one common reality. Uh, one can generalize this further and make a general cross-cultural study of reports from many different cultures of interaction with different kinds of beings who are endowed with what we would call paranormal or mystical powers. And you can see that uh, the same features appear over and over again in these different accounts. So uh, I'm interpreting this as evidence that these accounts refer to something actually real. That people from different cultures are describing the same sort of thing because they're interacting with an actual reality as opposed to simply speculating or uh, coming up with mere poetry. This monument is a Vimana. In the ancient texts, there is talk of abductions by aliens, a current theme today. If you go to the Mahabharata, which is an ancient Sanskrit text, you can read about the abduction of a man named Duryodhana, who was a king. Uh, he was carried away to another place by certain types of beings who then uh, spoke to him and explained how they were using him as part of a political scheme that they were involved with. If you look at the specific way that they took him away, the way they dealt with him, the way they brought him back, uh, the way he psychologically responded to this by forgetting about the whole episode and having ex an experience of missing time, as it's called, You'll see there are many parallels between that and the modern day accounts of abductions. So I would propose that a similar kind of thing is happening. But is there a common thread between the various cultures? The old Indian tradition, uh, traditions uh, which go back to the uh, Aryan, Aryan writings, the Vedas, now the the Aryans, the so-called Aryans, uh, came from Anatolia. And if you study again all these ancient religions and cultures, you see that they all are versions in their languages uh, with their names for the gods uh, of the Sumerian pantheon. All the ancient ones <coughs> being the Indian ones. So all the Vedic gods, the Aryan gods, uh, you can shift uh, to the Americas if you want. Uh, you know, in, in, in Mesoamerica, the Aztecs spoke of the chief god, uh, Quetzalcoatl. Uh, the Mayas called him uh, Kukulkan. Uh, both names meant the same thing. The winged serpent, the serpent with wings, which was the name of the Egyptian god Thoth, uh, which was the, his name in Sumerian uh, uh, in the pantheon there so no matter how you change the names or in uh, in South America uh, they called him Viracocha which meant the father creator so all these all these if you strip them from their language and say but what does it mean what does Viracocha mean what does this mean you find that it is the same story the same Anunnaki who came to earth from Nibiru this thesis of stitching, with a common root for all these histories, is fascinating, even though it's been much discussed. UFO sightings are present in many cultures. In the Greek culture, they talk about luminous bodies seen in the sky, the docks. In the Roman era, Plina, Seneca, and Tito Livio talk about the UFO phenomenon. In a book by Cinlio Osquente, in the 3rd century AD, we read about flying burning shields, the clippi ardente. There are also UFOs painted in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance.
This engraving of 1479 shows a flying object in rocket form. In the Baal Press in 1561, you can see spheres in the sky and in Nuremberg, still in 1561. You can see burning columns. At the same time, two spheres were seen in the sky at Hamburg. In the USA, towards the end of the last century, there were sightings of airships and spaceships. In 1896, it was the turn of a flying saucer above San Francisco. In 1909, this strange flying machine was sighted. The modern history of the UFOs started on the 24th of June, 1947, with the sighting of a mysterious object by the American pilot, Kenneth Arnold. But how did the UFOs, over the centuries, have so many different shapes? Johannes Fiebag. I think that it's an explanation. My hypothesis, that I have called the hypothesis of the black eye, is that these objects adapt themselves to our imagination. What we see are not spaceships in the sense in which we understand as our rockets or space probes. They are projections, which we can also assume are material forms. I think that they adapt themselves to our conceptions of the moment. Probably for this reason, the Middle Ages, sailing ships were not seen a hundred years ago, like those described by Jules Verne. Today, however, we see discs, cigarette-shaped objects, or more recently, triangular objects. Perhaps the whole UFO... still adapting to our imagination of the moment. A phenomenon which seems to be linked to this complex and mysterious theme is that of crop circles. The question one could ask is, is there perhaps someone who's trying to tell us something, as they were thousands of years ago? Since the 70s, in southern England, these strange designs have been observed, unexpectedly by night. It was immediately thought of as a hoax, which was true in some cases. But the study of the phenomenon that's, shows that's that many circles noise. are genuine. Stand in the center. An you abnormal radioactivity very, very was revealed on the spot I can, I can and in the lab. It. I can feel it the change, the structure of the wheat ears, was examined. Yeah. What's more, the ear spikes are only bent and not broken. How is this possible? And the fields have obviously been interfered with. Mr. Taylor. They are definitely genuine. Uh, I have lots of information to prove that something locks on to a particular thing in the cornfields, and they do this in the dark. What happens, you have a green field, and the... Whatever it is it can see in the dark, to such an extent it will pick a line that your eyes, the human eyes, cannot pick up in the day, lock onto that, and use that as a center point. I have many small circles about this big, right in the middle of the tram lines, and that's about 11 meters away from anywhere, and there are no marks to it at all. And then the crop circle can form any size it wishes from that point onwards. The phenomenon is present in many countries, not just England. All over the world. They're in Russia and as well. We've had Russian people come to England to 
to look at our crop circles to see if they're the same as the ones they have in Russia. We have them in ice lakes, we've had them in Sweden, in Canada, um, uh, three countries all together where we have t enormous rings cut into ice. And the strange thing is the water doesn't freeze over again. It just simply stays with a ring in the middle of this lake, and that's very difficult to understand. Colin Andrews. Certainly since 1989, uh, there were, uh, there began uh, hoaxing. Uh, so undoubtedly, many of the crop circles appearing around the world, but particularly in southern England, are hoaxed circles. But for certain, uh, there is a core phenomena, uh, which is a very important phenomena. Uh, I have my own views. Uh, on where I think perhaps the, shall we say, the crop circle maker is coming from. The crop circle phenomena has a complete and absolute parallel with that UFO situation. And therefore, I am left believing that after 12 and a half years of looking at this scientifically as an engineer myself, that the phenomena has for sure in my mind an intelligent uh, an intelligent application. No, it is uh, not a. It is not a joke. Um, even my uh, colleague back in England, uh, Nick Pope, uh, working as the Air Secretariat at the Ministry of Defence in London, just recently was uh, authorised to make a personal statement, and it's a very important personal statement. That being that the phenomena is real and that as far as the UFO component is concerned, that 5% of the aerial phenomena reported to the Ministry of Defence in London during the three-year period of his particular office, uh, a very a responsible office there, um, the 5% were uh, uh, classified as unexplained, and he went on to say far more than I would ever have imagined. And he said that he believed they were possibly and even probably of extraterrestrial origin. And here we now have a man who basically has broken ranks because he feels, as I feel, this is incredibly important and it's important to our time. This is a very important time for the survival of humanity, let alone the resolution of a phenomenon of this kind, which is potentially profound. This is a special time. Since 1976, when we first realized the significance of the ozone problem and the deterioration in the environmental situation, since that time, that same year, the crop circle phenomena arrived. It has continued to escalate in complexity in its size, in its distribution. Native Americans can understand some of the crop signs. And when I went to America, a Hopi Indian drew out exactly this design. He did not know that I had this on my files. And he explained that this is the sign of the Creator returning. And when we see this sign, we must be ready for him. We have looked very closely at the building blocks of the crop circle phenomena. And they are identical to those patterns which we have seen in, uh, from the Native Americans, in the Hopi Indians, the Dogon people, the Aborigines, uh, they, they, all of the indigenous peoples have drawn these same patterns for many, many years. And when in experimental laboratory conditions, we attempt to uh, uh, look carefully at the human mind in a state of uh, meditation, when you place a, a dark screen in front of your eyes and you try to think zero state, 
the first thing that occurs is that simple patterns begin to cross your, your vision. These are known as the phosphenes, the innermost workings of the human mind. These are the same patterns. It isn't a direct interference, it is a spiritual nudge, a pulling, a twigging, widening of our vision. And it starts in one place and must finish there, its self. I think these times are too dangerous to rely upon the direct involvement of extraterrestrials, nice as that might be, and nice as it may perhaps be at some point. But I think this starts and finishes with us. Man must take account of himself, of his responsibility towards the next man, towards nature and the entire universe. Everything is linked. This is the message. Near to Stonehenge, a very ancient place, a sacred and mysterious place, some artificial hillocks record an exceptional event of distant time long ago, which according to some experts records the landing of a UFO. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Youth Orbs Disclosure Channel for weekly UFO and Orb sightings. Since the beginning of time, some ancient mysteries have never been solved. To take an unforgettable journey where no one has dared to go for thousands of years. Until now. giants in the earth in those days, and when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children, the same became mighty men, which were of old men. Regardless of race, region, religion, or age, every society has created legends about giants. The Maya and Incas of South America believed a race of giants existed on Earth before the Great Flood. So did many other ancient civilizations. Some took them for gods, others left likenesses of them in stone or wrote about them in their histories. The Greeks and Romans told of blood falling from heaven and landing in the lap of the Earth goddess Gaia, who gave birth to the Titans a race of fearsome giants.
Again, here is the UFO. On the 3rd of May, 1975, the pilot, Carlos de los Santos, was flying in a Piper aeroplane. He called the control tower. Mayday, mayday. I no longer have control of the plane. I see three UFOs flying around me. One has touched the bottom of the plane. The plane is flying without my control. I can see the UFOs. One of them is opposite me. One is on the right wing, and one is apparently under the plane. Carlos was able to escape, but in other cases, in other countries, it doesn't always have a happy ending like this. Mexico City. The UFO sightings became very frequent after the total eclipse of the sun in 1991. After the eclipse, the Vigilantes organization was born. These are some of their photos. Here is a UFO which seems to turn in the spiral on itself. Here is the same object filmed from a different location 